Oh boy, has it been a while. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Morganon. So over two and a half years ago, I began making videos for Dark Mysteries. It was a mod for Gothic, which uh, had impressed me the first time I played it, but I never actually got around to finishing it. And so I decided to uh, use that as what came up to be my second completed series on YouTube. Speaking of which, we are actually very close to reaching my third year since I began making videos. Time has flown, it really has. So, uh, the video series I did for Dark Mysteries didn't really hit very big at the time, but that was largely because I was just such a small channel and uh, wasn't exactly something that people were looking for. But by the same token, it was also something that didn't, there was no video of on YouTube, and so that's why I decided to do something that no one else had done before, and uh, it turned out to work pretty well for me because it grew kind of as a sleeper hit into one of the biggest things I've done. Uh, it has been surpassed in recent years by uh, Gothic 3, for example, but it, it still kind of, it can t kind of continues to get uh, a lot of views, which surprises me. Unfortunately, it just turned out to be a really buggy, unfinished mess of good ideas, and as such, uh, I consider the basically considered the walkthrough to be a failure, uh, simply because I could not complete it without using cheats uh, and console commands and everything, and the story was pretty much broken as a result of certain quest triggers that just would not activate. Uh, activate. Sorry, I think I'm getting a little tongue-tied. It's been almost a month since I actually recorded anything. Um, so with Gothic 2 and 3, as well as every Risen game already completed on my channel, I thought I would just kind of return to my roots and create a just top-to-bottom redo of my Gothic walkthrough with no mods whatsoever. Uh, I was convinced to attempt the Golden mod, which was mostly a an attempt to... I guess just really patch the game, but also add a little extra content and try and restore content that was cut from uh, Piranha Bytes' um, premiere release, uh, such as the uh, Quentin and the Bandits uh, in their little hole near the uh, Troll Valley, and uh, also allow you to assault the Free Mine if you're a member of the Guards. And the problem is, once again, that just didn't work either. I had a number of bugs, most of which I kind of endured, but one which was just completely game-breaking. I couldn't uh, get around it. It was a problem where the I had noticed it because a lot of quests that I was doing were not updating properly. The journal updates were not showing up, and uh, a lot of the dialogue that I was supposed to trigger wasn't showing up. And I wasn't really sure what was going on with it until I tried to do the part of the story where you meet with Urshak, the orc shaman. Shaman. I still have to get used to <laughs> calling it right. Um, so basically, he wasn't spawning when he was supposed to. And even if you used console commands to spawn him, because the journal did not update properly, he had no dialogue. And so you couldn't progress the story at all. And as such, the golden mod was a bust. I couldn't do it. So... I gave up on any kind of quest mods whatsoever. I'm just playing the vanilla game, and all I have installed was a 60 FPS patch and uh, a texture pack called Freddy's Texture Pack, and so just a slight graphics overhaul for the game, and that's all I've done to it. Now, unfortunately, I had hoped that uh, this would be my first YouTube series in glorious 60 FPS, but unfortunately, uh, as soon as I have recording going on, as soon as I activate the, uh, as soon as I hit the record button on DX3, it tanks down to about 30 FPS, and in fact, in most cases, the game still runs above that, but even when I have DX3 set to record at 60 FPS, it will not go above 30, even as the game reaches 60, and I can't really explain why that is, but basically the bottom line is I have to keep it at 30 frames per second, and, uh, you're just gonna have to deal with it. Anyway... Uh, I really took my time with this. I didn't really expect to have as much trouble starting it as I turned out to have, and I can't really explain why I did for the most part. I just had motivational issues that were preventing me from really getting going because 
for some reason, I, I just keep interpreting this as a much more monumental task than any other walkthrough I've done, just because I want to get it perfect, and I, just, I'm so afraid that I'm going to miss things and uh, just do things in such a disjointed manner that's not really going to be a perfect walkthrough. But I finally gave up. I said, I figured to myself, you guys subscribe to me because you like what I do and you like how I do it. So here we go. Now uh, the other problem is. Uh, for the last two weeks or so, I've been dealing with a really nasty cold, and I can't really record videos when I'm congested and coughing and sneezing uncontrollably, so I just had to take an extension on my sabbatical, as it were. Anyway, we're finally getting started, and uh, I hope you all have been uh, waiting quite patiently. Now let's get going. The Kingdom of Murtana, united by King Robar II. During the long years of his reign, he was able to defeat all foes of his realm. All except one. the orcs took its toll and the prisoners of the realm were to pay the price. The king needed swords for his army and every man guilty of a crime, no matter how insignificant, was forced to work in the ore mines of Corinus. To make it impossible for them to escape, the king sent out the best magicians of the kingdom to create a magic barrier around the entire valley. I was one of them. Uh, something disturbed the delicate structure of magic. We were trapped inside our own barrier. One second of negligence was enough for the prisoners. Corinus was now under the control of the convicts. The king had no choice. He had to negotiate. He needed the ore. Month after month, the king supplied everything the prisoners needed. Month after month, they brought the ore to the edge of the barrier in exchange. Until the present day, another convict was brought to the cliff. He did not know, but he would change everything. In the name of King Robar II, bearer of the scepter of Verant, I sentence this convict to... Stop! Convict, I've got an offer to make you. This letter must reach the leader of the Magicians of Fire. You're wasting your time. You may choose your own reward. They'll give you anything you ask for. Very well. I'll take your letter. On one condition. Spare me the rest of his nonsense. How dare you? Keep silent. Right. Send him in. Ah! <sighs> Welcome to the colony. Ouch. That's enough. Leave him alone. And now scram. Get up. I'm Diego. Hey, Diego. I'm... I'm not interested in who you are. You've just arrived. I look after the new arrivals. That's all for now. If you plan to stay alive for a while, you should talk to me. But of course, I won't keep you from choosing your own destruction. Well, what do you think? Now, I just have to point out that, um... Of course, everyone is well aware that the Nameless Hero is never actually given a name throughout the games. And, uh... It's not that he has no name, it's just that there's a convenient reason why he doesn't tell it to anybody who asks, or uh, even is prevented from telling it to uh, 
just out of, out of his own uh, will. And it's just kind of funny to me that Diego, right off the bat, says he's not interested in who you are. And as a result, throughout all your trials and tribulations, through all three games, and I'm not including the uh, non uh releases, means he never actually figures out what your name is. In spite of the really close friendship that you guys have. And it's just, it's especially poignant for Diego because he's the only one who outright refuses or outright just prevents you from actually saying your name to him, whereas nobody else even really bothers to bothers to ask, and your character never bothers to tell them. So that's just very amusing to me. Okay, what do I need to know about this place? We call it the Colony. You'll know already that we produce ore for the king. Well, at least we do, in the old camp. There are three camps within the barrier. The old camp is the biggest, and it was the first. How do I get to the old camp? You just follow this path. The old camp is the next reasonably safe looking place you'll come across. There are a lot of wild beasts between the camps. You'd be mad to walk around without a weapon. Where do I get a weapon? When you get to the old mine, have a look around. I'm sure you'll find something useful. The mine is easy to find. It's just a few meters along the canyon. Why did you help me? Because you needed help. Otherwise, Bullet and his boys might have killed you. And I couldn't just stand by and watch, because I came all this way to make a suggestion. A suggestion? Yes. After this little incident with Bullet and his guys, you should be aware now that you need protection. Everyone who arrives here has a choice. There are three camps in the colony, and you'll have to join one of them. Says who? I'm here to show the new ones. I'm a lone wolf, bitch. Is the best place for them. Where's Bullet now? He and the others bring the goods from the outside world into the camp. You'll find him there. But if you plan to fight him, be careful. He's an experienced warrior. Now, I just have to point out, Diego talks about how he's trying to convince all the new arrivals that the old camp is the best place for him. And that might not necessarily be untrue if you're already, like, a really strong fellow who can really work his way up. The problem is that the old camp has a nasty habit of abusing all the new arrivals, as we've, as we've already seen with Bullet. So I can't exactly say they've given a good first impression, and this means one of two things as far as I'm concerned. Either Diego is kind of, you know, has an illusion of the old camp as being a safe place, whereas the other two locations are actually a little bit better, or he's just, this is his job. He's re It's his task given by these superiors at the old camp that he has to try and bring all the new arrivals there just so, you know, they can work for them in, instead of empowering the other camps. I have a letter for the High Magician of the Circle of Fire. Really? I was given it by a mage shortly before they threw me in here. You're lucky I can't afford to show my face around the mages anymore. Anyone else would gladly slit your throat for that letter. That's because the mages pay their couriers a lot, and most people here don't have anything. If I were you, I'd shut up until I met one of the mages. Although in your situation, that's not likely to happen. Why not? The mages are in the castle in the old camp. Only Gomez's people are allowed to enter the castle. Who's Gomez? Gomez is the most powerful ore baron. He's the boss of the old camp, the most powerful man in the colony. Let's assume I want to join his people. What do I need to do? At the gate of the castle, you'll find a man called Thoris. Tell him Diego sent you. Thanks for your help. We'll meet in the old camp. Now, I do just want to point out that Diego actually responds a little bit differently if you were to, uh... Oh, my goodness. Why is it stuttering so much? That's never happened before. Oh, Lord. Oh, dear. Uh, that's not good. Alright, well, it turns out that if I have DX3 set to record at 30 frames a second while still running the game at 60, causes a really bad, st like, stuttering with all the animations. I'm not sure if you guys could see that, since you were seeing it at half the speed I was playing at, but basically I just had to reset DX3 to 
uh, only run the game at 30 frames a second as well, so that there's no desync between the uh, recording time and the uh, frame rate that it's playing at. Which is unfortunate, because that kind of defeats the purpose of actually having the FPS unlocker. But uh, the FPS unlocker prevented the game from being run at, I think it was capped at 24 frames per second before, which was just kind of the way uh, some of the older games, like the older 3D games, just how they did it. Because 24 frames per second is the same as a uh, film uh, records at, so uh, just retroactively modders have uh, enabled the game to run at 60, but the problem is the game's not really built to run like that. So it, it causes a bunch of animation problems, and in fact, running at a 60 also causes problems with turning your character. If you were to have the FPS set to 60, you would notice when you're trying to turn with a mouse, for example, he would just kind of stutter, and you would only move about this, this fast. So it really fucks with the mouse sensitivity and everything as well. Unfortunately, we're just going to have to endure the uh, inferior frame rate, but so be it. Now, this here is the uh, essentially the trading post. This is where the uh, all the uh, supplies are brought into the colony, and the old camp is the one who receives them. We'll learn more about why the other two camps don't uh, trade with the outside world at all. But basically, yeah, the barrier prevents anyone from coming or going. Well, not exactly true. You, we saw in the intro there was actually a woman who was uh, delivered into the camp on the uh, on the lift here, and she was able to make it through the barrier just fine, and as well, our character was shoved right through it from uh, right up there. I believe that's the platform we were shoved off from. I don't know why we couldn't take the lift as well. It was probably just because we showed up late. So uh, that's what happens, boys and girls. Got to make sure you're on time for all your uh, criminal appointments. Anyway. Ah, oh, shit, I can't get out. So, yeah, basically the barrier lets people in, but if you were to try and get back out, we'll see what happens. So let's say we were of a mind to try and escape. Sure, the uh, landscape is not exactly... Uh, what you would call forgiving as far as trying to escape, but we'll give it a try anyway. Maybe we, we can use this as a uh, ladder or a ramp of some kind. Huh, I'm glowing. That's probably not a good sign. Let's try and get on this then. Oh! Well, never you mind then. So that's what happens with the barrier. And all around here, there's just kind of some inane stuff you can grab. Just some um, very minor loot to try and help you get started. And uh, as far as the barrier goes, we also see further signs of people who are of a like mind as us. If you were to gaze down here. There's a whole bunch of skeletons kind of stuck down here. There could be people who simply died from uh, maybe drowning. Because apparently, if you don't make it in time to use the lift... The, uh, oh shit, the soldiers will just shove you down there. Alright, well, I seem to have glitched myself a bit. Thankfully, there are Marvin Mode commands to, uh, deal with that. There we go. Oh yeah, I forgot. Uh, the... I'll, I'll talk more about the console commands later, but basically, F8, when you have Marvin Mode enabled, not only does it bump you up like that, which can be useful for getting out of sticky situations and, uh, you know, just kind of making travel a bit shorter. It also restores you to full health, so if you want to avoid... If, if you're just trying to save time, but want to avoid actually cheating, you're going to have to avoid using that command as much as possible. Anyway, as far as Marvin Mode is concerned, the way to enable it is to open the character menu, this uh, sort of profile here, and then type the word Marvin, M-A-R-V-I-N, as fast as you can, and immediately close the menu. So... Marvin C. And, uh... I, I usually just say Marvin C because... I have... The, the way I have my control set, C is the button to open this menu. So, that's just how I do. Now, altogether, those of you playing this game for the first time might be really put off by the controls. And, uh, of course, Gothic veterans are fully aware of uh, how to deal with this control scheme. And, uh, just its general shortcomings but also how to just 
make the best of it. Essentially, the way you interact with anything is you highlight it by uh, just focusing your character's view on it. And uh, I will demonstrate that with these fools over here. While on the subject of controls, I just kind of want to add this in because I did uh, forget to mention it. If you rebind your keys, you will probably run into the problem where uh, the default functions of those keys are still active. So uh, you often get the problem where one uh, control will actually try and perform two functions at the same time. For example, I have jump bound to spacebar, but spacebar by default is the button to draw your weapon. So oftentimes when I'm trying to jump, he'll just uh, draw his weapon instead. So uh, it's just kind of annoying. You do have to deal with that. And uh, essentially, just because it's so screwed up, you have to just get used to using the default keys as much as possible or just finding out you know, how to avoid ways to avoid performing the function you don't want it to actually do. So here's a fellow. Two fellows, in fact. So I highlight him. I can focus on him with left click, and that gives me a whole lot of things I can do. But uh, if you don't have a weapon drawn, there's pretty much only one thing you can generally do, which is to highlight them, focus on them with left click, and press the forward movement key to activate whatever object you're looking at, which includes talking to people. What are you doing here? Making sure no one gets near the exchange place, especially one of those cutthroats from the new camp. You're the new guy they chucked in today, right? That's me. Then you'd better watch out for the guys from the new camp. I work for the old camp, same as the others you saw at the exchange place. I assume you've talked to Diego. Yep. Yes, I have. Good. Then you know what's what around here. In general, I can't say, uh... You'd better... Whoops. I can't say that, uh, he taught me everything in a matter of minutes. Now, I am going to turn down the, uh... Music volume a bit. I'm not sure why I had those reversed. The music's a little too loud. It's kind of, uh, imposing on people's voices. Why do I have to watch out for the guys from the new camp? Compared to the new camp, the old camp's a quiet, peaceful sort of place. The new camp doesn't get any deliveries from the outside world. Whoa. Most of the rogues there just steal whatever they need. And the old camp? The ore barons have everything under control. Next in line to them are the guards, followed by the shadows. The diggers are the lowest. Everyone who arrives here starts out as a digger. If you want to become something better than that, you'll have to get accepted as a shadow first. When I was washed ashore, one of the guys punched me in the face. They do that to all the newcomers. They call it Standing Godfather. Oh, are all the guys like that in the old camp? We do have a few suckers, but they won't touch you as long as you pay them protection money. So all in all, they're really playing up how great the old camp is, but as soon as you call them into question, they are, you know, uh, they freely admit when they have some really shitty things going on. I saw a woman being sent down with the goods. Yeah, the ore barons get everything they want. Do you mean to say the king exchanges women for ore? They're convicted criminals too, of course. But if Gomez hadn't asked for them, they'd be sitting in some dungeon or other. I'm not sure what's worse. I'd have to say I'm a bigger fan of the latter. I'm looking for a weapon. There should be some old weapons by the derelict mine further down the canyon. But don't go and start a war with nothing but a rusty pickaxe for a weapon. Those things are slow and heavy. An inexperienced fighter should never use one of them unless it's an emergency. Well, thanks for your help, buddy. Now, as far as weapons go, there are two classes of melee weapons, which are single-handed weapons and two-handed weapons. And uh, single-handed, uh, two-handed weapons, as he said, are slower, which includes the pickaxe, and overall very cumbersome. You can't really backstep as quickly. But because the backstep doesn't protect you in this game the way it does in Gothic 2, that's not really a huge problem. But they do attack quite a bit slower as well, so you have to bear that in mind. Now, as far as combat goes, 
You can also attack with your fists, should it be necessary. And if you time... Time your uh, button presses carefully, you can uh, do a bit of a combo attack. Now, combo attacks are a bit harder to pull off in this game than I'd say they are in Gothic 2, just as a result of the fact that you require more inputs due to the awkward control scheme. So basically, this combat functions the same way as uh, just in any other kind of interaction in the world, which uh, I will demonstrate a bit more once we have a weapon and some enemies to fight. Opening a chest is the same way. When you hold left click on it, he'll kneel down in front of it. And the way you interact with it depends on uh, each of the four movement keys. Forward will open it. And here we have uh, sorted loot. We've got a pick lock, or lock pick. We've got a torch, got some arrows, got some uh, useless gold coins, and we've got some beer. And uh, essentially to loot something, you have to hold left click on it, and then use the movement keys to say where you want to put it. So if I want to put something back into the chest, I press left. If I want to take it back out, I highlight it, hold left click, press right. And when you have a lot of an object, uh, it the game will only move ten of, ten of those objects with each click, as you can see here. So if you want to move individual pieces, you have to use the turn buttons, which I have set to Q and E. So holding left click, press E. That's how you get one at a time. If you want to move a hundred of an item at once, which I don't have a hundred of any item, but I do have eleven here, you hold left click on it, hold shift, and then press the button to uh, dictate where you want it to go. And that's all there is to it. Close the menu with either escape or the back button, which uh, I've set to right click, which is also jump key. And um, yeah, that's about it. If you run into a chest that you can't open, that means it's locked. And in order to open a chest that is locked, you either need the key or a lockpick. If you have the key, it will open just automatically. You, in fact, don't have to press any movement keys. However, if it is locked, if you do not have the key, you can try to pick it, which I will demonstrate later once we actually have a lockpicking skill and a te uh, chest to test it on. The only problem with this game, which I will uh, again address once we actually reach that point, is if you have a chest that can only be unlocked with a key, and by that I mean... Were there, were there two pickaxes here? No. I don't know what else I picked up then. Uh, yeah, if you have a a chest that can only be opened with a key, you can still try to unlock it with a lockpick, you're just never going to succeed. And the problem is you can still break your lockpicks doing that, so... Thankfully they did change that in Gothic too. so if it requires a key, uh, you won't even be able to attempt to pick it. Keep your eye out for very obvious ledges such as these, because you can uh, climb most of the landscape in the game much more freely than you can do in, for example, Risen 2 or 3. So you can find some neat stuff if you explore a little bit. Up here on this sort of uh, plateau, we have uh, quite a few animals that we can go and fight. And here I will demonstrate the uh, combat system. Because you interact with the same keys you fight with, you are essentially in two different modes when you have your weapon drawn. So to draw your weapon, that puts you in essentially combat mode. So the only interaction you can do with any object is to attack it. Now, as far as the interact buttons work with this, there are essentially three different ways you can attack. If you hold left click on your enemy or just hold it in the air, you can do a forward attack, which, if you have high enough skills, which we have no skills whatsoever, will turn into a string of combo attacks, which, with proper timing of your clicks, uh, you can just, you know, just launch a string of attacks that you can generally um, pull off before your enemy can counter in any way. But the problem is, of course, that there's a slight pause at the end of the combo, so you do have to try and compensate for that. More useful, in my opinion, are the left and right swings, which you can keep going infinitely as long as you time it properly, which I am failing to do so. The problem, of course, is that two-handed weapons are much slower. 
So if you use these, you pretty much only want to land one blow at a time. And you do have to go left and right. You can't go left twice, for example. It's not going to do anything. And you can't go right twice. It's not going to do anything. But you can go left, right, forward. You can kind of string them together in any sort of organic, fluid manner that you can think of. But in general, you don't want to just spam things until death. Now, the final function you can do is uh, hold left click and push ba hold backwards, and that will block. The only problem with blocking, you might be tempted to try and do it after attacking, and oftentimes it just doesn't respond properly. And if you take a hit, of course your reflex might be to try and block after that. But I notice there's seems to be a glitch where you just can't get your block up immediately after taking a hit. And so that often opens you to taking a lot more hits if you get a little panicky. So you just kind of have to bear that in mind. Unfortunately, even with a back step, there's no way to really dodge in this game. And this demonstrates when you have a two-handed weapon, the back step kind of has that weird second step afterwards, which is what slows it down so much. So that's why backpedaling is uh, even less useful with two-handed weapons. Anyway, let's try fighting. Okay, we've got two mole rats who don't seem too worried about me. Now they are. So if I hold block, you can attack. You can block any melee attack in the game, including from animals. That was changed in Gothic 2, but it's the only way you can defend yourself in this game. Now, of course, blocking will only work for them in the front, so if I allowed this guy to get behind me, he would still be able to hit me even if I had my weapon up. So if you understand the enemy AI, you can just launch a combo attack and prevent them from ever attacking you, but a lot of enemies are much more aggressive than these little uh, monsters are. What we found here was a club. The club is the first one-handed weapon that you can find if you go up in this direction, but because we have no skill, we still essentially use it as a two-handed weapon. It just behaves differently. And you can overall see that it, if I can get it right, it is a little bit faster with the right timing of your swings than a two-handed weapon is. And I think it gets even faster once you are actually able to wield it in exactly one hand. So that's kind of how you have to do it with uh, two-handed weapons. One-handed weapons are generously faster, but they do generally less damage. And I think have a uh, lower critical damage. And critical hits are... One of the uh, critical hits are essentially the other reason why you want to improve your weapon skills. Uh, if you you see our weapon skills on the top right there, we're unskilled in everything. And next to that is a percentage value. We have 0%. That means we have no chance whatsoever of scoring a critical hit. When you get your skill maxed out, you have a 10% chance of scoring a critical hit on any of your attacks. And that's very important. Critical hits often are much more useful generally have a lot more to do a lot more towards determining whether you win a fight than you know simply landing a lot of normal attacks so getting your critical value higher is very important now here we have a goblin the problem is goblins have at this point in the game the goblins are pretty tough but this one I've noticed doesn't tend to be terribly aggressive another thing you notice is a lot of enemies try to strafe you like this one did the forward movement attack doesn't really do... Isn't really able to track them as well as the left... Oh, shit, he hit me. Isn't really able to track enemies as well as the left or right swings are. Oh, he killed me. So, you see, he's quite tough. Whoops, I loaded the wrong one. Spoiler alert! Oh, why is it doing that? Holy smokes. That is not good. I don't like that. That was very strange, and now that makes me very worried. Because that's going to happen again once we reach that point in the game. Alright, so left to right swings, of course, you can keep them up infinitely, but they don't... They don't have as much range as a forward attack does. So if the enemy's too far away, you do have to use a forward attack. And if you want to try and stop a combo and uh, kind of prevent yourself from being vulnerable during the, um, during the sort of uh, recovery from your swing, you can block. And that'll stop the uh, recovery animation sooner. So it also helps because if you try and do a combo attack while an enemy's strafing around you, 
uh, you will not track them. You'll keep attacking in the same direction while the enemy gets behind you. And the only way to stop yourself and uh, turn to face your enemy again is to block like that. So blocking is pretty much a necessity in this game for a lot of reasons. So you, can, you have to get used to practicing with it. Essentially, if you ever miss a swing, the right idea is to block afterwards. I'm actually going to set the uh, view distance further. I'm not sure why it's so close. That barely helps. The fog is not... The fog is a lot more substantial than I remember it being. I might have accidentally set something down in the... in the uh, config file. So I don't remember it being this close. I used to be able to see all the way across the map. Now you see this uh, the scavenger here is kind of staring me down a little bit. Now he's threatening me. So he's aware of me from this distance. And if I get too close, he kind of... He gives that little uh, threatening posture. And it's, if you allow that to continue for a few cycles, he will come a-charging. Come on, then. Not very aggressive, as much as he tried to pretend he was. So I'm going to figure out what happened with the uh, draw distance after I do this recording, so hopefully the game will look a bit better as a result. And if you're a little bit quicker, you can get the jump on some fellows. But unfortunately, I missed my swing there, so... Either way, he is a wimp, and he was no threat whatsoever. Now, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite little exploits in this game. One that helps you travel a lot more quickly and safely. But, uh... If you guys don't want to kind of spoil the game and, uh... You know, exploit it the way I have no problem doing, I recommend you look away now. So, essentially, what happens is, if you fall off a ledge or jump off, all you have to do is hold the strafe key and you can avoid taking damage from the fall. So, to demonstrate. If you were to just jump off, you see it kind of pitches forward like that, and as soon as you land, you're dead. So, if you fall from too high, uh, the fall will very easily kill you. However, if you were to hold the strafe key as you fall, it stops your character from pitching forward like that, and as such, you can land on your feet safely. So... Yeah, if you don't want to exploit the game like that, then uh, get used to doing a lot more walking than I do. Alright, you little bugger. So what I found there was a sword. This is another single-handed sword, which means it does function the same way as the club does, for example. Now, the problem is, for some reason, I don't know why, I never had this problem before, but the first two swords we find here seem to be glitched. For some reason, the, their range is substantially shorter than any other weapon in the game, and that's never happened to me in any previous attempts at playing this game. And for the record, I am playing on the good old games version of this. I tried the Steam version, and it just it didn't really work with these mods that I hadn't installed, so it was uh, hugely problematic. And so, I'll kind of demonstrate. It's either this sword... Or this sword here, this old sword. Or it might be both of them, I don't really remember. But for some reason, like, it led me to think that there might have been a glitch with... Um... One-handed weapons altogether. That was preventing them from actually having the range that they were supposed to. But this one actually seems fine. So the range on the rusty sword is normal. The range on the old sword is what seemed to be screwed up. Let's see if I can demonstrate that as well. Or maybe that's gotten fixed, because I did reinstall the game at some point. Yeah, okay, see this one? It doesn't... It's not hitting him from the right range. Even the same range as the other weapons I was using. So, the old sword is bugged for my build of the game, and I'm not really sure why, but that might not be the case for you guys. So... I wouldn't fret about it too much, and it doesn't really matter, because it's not that much more powerful than the other weapons you get right now. Anyway, now as far as glitches go, this game is, is extremely glitchy, and often breaks in ways 
that uh, no one else has ever experienced. So that's one of the one of the quirks, and I guess kind of the charms of this game is it's always gonna surprise you in some way, but never in a way that you really uh, appreciate. Anyway, so uh, yeah, as far as glitches go, I do have a problem on this build, which I have verified happens even if I reinstall the game on the good old games version, where there's a really critical uh, chest later in the game that has an item you need in order to progress the story. And if the problem is you're supposed to kill an enemy and get a key from him, and that key is supposed to open the chest, for some reason, in whatever patched version this is, that key does not work. So the chest does not open, and the chest cannot be picked either, because they don't want you opening it before you reach the right part of the game. So, uh, that is a very critical problem. But I found a workaround in the sense that all I have to do is use the Marvin Mode console to add the items I need. Oh shit, the water's flickering. Oh dear, I thought I dealt with that. Hopefully that won't be as bad as it was before. Now here we got some fellows here, and these guys look different than the uh, dudes we have encountered thus far. They're wearing different outfits. They don't quite look as uh, militaristic as the other guys. So let's have a word with them. Hey you. Hey. What do you want? I want to warn you. If you continue this way, you'll be entering our hunting ground. What do you hunt? Mostly scavengers. There's a lot of meat on them. Besides, it ain't too hard to get them, once you know how. Really? How's that? Ask my friend Drax here. He knows more about these things than anyone. Why is this area so dangerous? You've just arrived, haven't you? There are different areas in this colony which are all more or less dangerous. The paths between the camps are quite safe, but even there you might come across some wolves which look on you as uh, easy prey. And that's exactly what you are until you get a proper weapon and armor. Where can I get better equipment? The nearest place is that old camp. Just follow the path that brought you here. But you can get the stuff cheaper in our new camp, provided you know the right people. If you go to the old camp, ask for more drag. He's one of us. For just a little ore, he'll sell you the proper goods. Now we'll meet more drag and, uh see what exactly he has to offer, but he kind of, this guy is kind of lying to us. Essentially, every item in the game has a base price, and no merchant sells it for more or less than another. So, that's kind of a lie. But, uh, what we've, the vibe that this guy's given us so far is that the new camp is not quite the, uh, gaggle of rogues and cutthroats that, uh, so far everyone from the old camp has implied them to be. Tell me more about the areas of the colony. If you travel between the camps, you'll need a map to distinguish paths and dead ends. Dead ends often lead you to dangerous canyons where you encounter creatures you'd better avoid. Do not enter the old ruins. There are too many around here, and most of them are old fortifications dating back to the time of the first orc war. Some are abandoned orc dwellings. There are often orcs in those ruins, or even worse creatures. I'd avoid those places, especially at night. And one more hint, don't go into the forest. Where do I get a map? Ask the people in the old camp. There's a cartographer living there. Maybe you can steal one of his maps. If you manage to do it, take one from me as well. If I manage to get them without paying, I'll take as many as I can carry. You're all right. You should consider coming to the new camp. In case you go there, ask for Lars. He takes care of the new ones. I'm sure he'll have a job for you. And so what he says there does kind of uh, play into the idea that the that the new camp are at least a bunch of thieves. Because he, he was very encouraging us to uh, steal from the old camp. Which is, we'll learn later, is exactly how these, how these guys kind of uh, subsist, essentially. The only way that these guys, the uh, new camp stays alive, because they don't really trade with anybody else. Thanks for your help. Don't go thinking everyone's going to be so friendly, kid. There may not be much in a newcomer's pockets, 
but some folks would even beat you up for a pickaxe. I'll keep it in mind. All right, so that's all this guy has to tell us, and uh, he tell he kind of suggests that he will uh, give you maybe reward you if you were to steal maps from the cartographer in the old camp, but that's not actually true. First of all, you can only get one map from the cartographer, and you can't steal it from him exactly. I've tried stealing, I've tried going through to the guy trying to pickpocket him, trying to open his chest and everything, and he does not carry any other maps apart from what he has in his merchant inventory. And the one that you can get from him with, uh, you know, dialogue options. So, uh, that's, there's nothing you can actually do. He won't reward you for giving him a map. And you have no way to give it to him, of course. What he says about the dangerous areas of the colony is actually very much true. Um, there are monsters pretty much everywhere. The camps are the only remotely safe places. And even then, you do have to worry about the fact that, uh, you know, this is a colony of criminals. Which uh, is kind of a point I really want to address as well. Um, but, yeah, basically, you don't want to wander at all at this point in the game. You want to kind of stick to the safer areas around the camps. There will be monsters there as well. You can uh, kill them and level up, which is, you know, kind of what you got to do. Apart from that, you can just handle quests, which you get experience from, and that'll help you level up as well. But all around, until you get some armor and a decent weapon, you really don't want to fight anything besides the uh, juvenile animals roaming around here. And uh, as far as this colony goes, so far all we've seen are criminals. Everyone here is an asshole, or at least uh, we are well aware that everyone thrown into this colony is a criminal. They're convicted of crimes and they're sent here by the king's orders to work and uh, mine ore and then deliver it to the uh, kingdom. And they're pretty much here for good. They're sentenced to life of servitude, essentially. And what ended up happening is the when the barrier was formed to keep them in here, it distracted the guards who were supposed to watch over them. And that that's something, one of the uh, kind of weird little plot holes that I've never really gotten answered for me is, were the guards aware of the fact that they were going to be stuck in here with uh, convicts? Because they were clearly in the castle when the barrier was formed. And the castle was clearly part of the area that they intended to lock behind the barrier. So, were they also essentially sentencing these guards to life behind the barrier as well? And I'm wondering if the guards were even aware of it. Because we saw that once the barrier was formed, the guards were all horribly distracted by it. And that allowed the convicts to revolt and take over the whole colony for themselves. So that's one of the plot holes I don't really get. And on top of that, uh, it also adds to the uh, really unique uh, setting we have going on here, which is, you know, an entire civilization of nothing but criminals. Almost nothing but criminals. There's about... A ha there's a handful of NPCs in this game who are actually not criminals. Uh, mostly the mages. So it's, just, it's very interesting. You, I can't think of any other... Um, any other story that has a setting quite like this. So that's definitely one of the biggest appeals of this game to me. You're hunting, aren't you? Looks like it. What do you want? Do you have some hints for the hunt? I could teach you a few things, but everything has its price. Which would be how much? A good gulp of beer will do to start with. Then we'll see. Well, I happen to have one of those. It's a bit warm, but uh... there you are. Take a beer and tell me about hunting. Scavengers. That's what we call the big birds. Should be attacked one after the other. It's easy to lure single scavengers from the pack. If you come too close, they'll become irritated. After a while, they'll storm in your direction. At this point. You should be waiting for them with a raised weapon. If you manage to strike the beast before it hits you, you have to keep fighting. Then you'll be able to defeat the creature without being hurt yourself. If it hits you first, well, just don't let him. Now what he's saying there, he's basically saying once you 
have struck the enemy, you have to keep up the assault. You pretty much have to spam them to death. And of course, that's a bad idea. You can block their attacks, and it is often very strategic to do so instead of attacking. Gothic 2 kind of has the same thing. If you uh, read some of the books in Gothic 2, they tell you about fighting monsters, saying that you can't block them with weapons, which is what is one of the changes to combat that they made between the two games. So... It was, it was just interesting because they in that game they also encourage you to just try and left click the glory and just spam enemies to death with attacks but again it was a very bad idea in that game because if you misclicked at all you would get the uh, monster would fuck you up so you had to learn how to do use the dodge mechanic in place of the block mechanic in that game so overall, these people can give some very, very bad advice on how to play this game. What else can you tell me about hunting? A lot, but it'll cost you more than a beer. If you know how, you can take the creature's teeth, claws, and skin. It's hard to get them, but they are valuable. At least every merchant will trade those things with you. Now he says that, but for the price of all of these skills... Uh, you, it's, the payout is never really quite worth it. I mean, it takes a long time to make your money back from these, because some, some of these items, like, uh, claws and teeth and such, only sell for about three ore, so you would have to kill a couple dozen monsters in order to make the money back for just learning that skill. You're demanding a lot for your advice. Possibly, but you can earn a lot of ore with this knowledge. All the animals you kill without knowing how to cut them up will just rot away. That's a wasted opportunity of skinning them and selling the fur at a high price. If I were you, I'd try to gain this knowledge as soon as possible. Now, that's also not necessarily untrue what he said there. Sure, these items may not have the monetary value that he's implying, but at some point in the game you do need these skills in order to progress and uh, if you don't have them, you can easily kind of screw yourself out of the end of the game. So be very careful. Now what he was suggesting and how to fight scavengers is partly useful, but you can easily uh, do it wrong. Essentially what he's suggesting is that you walk up to one of the scavengers. You, you can do this with a lot more than just scavengers. Most enemies behave this way as well. You see, he's kind of staring me down. Step close enough, and he starts doing that as he did before. Now, what he, what Drax was suggesting is that when they storm at you, you just start fighting them. So you, you saw that I was able to lure that one away. Unfortunately, they killed them all too fast for me to really demonstrate properly. But, uh, yeah, I could lure that one away. But if I did what Drax suggested and attacked the thing as soon as it neared me... The, he, we were still close enough that I could attract all the rest of the scavengers just by attacking that one. So, in reality, if you want to lure them away, you have to get them to follow you. You have to get them to charge you, and then run. Lure them away from the rest of the pack, and then fight them from a safe distance. So I'm just going to ignore these ones for now, because they're actually a little bit too tough. For uh, If I screwed anything up, they could easily get me killed. Now, there seems to be a bit of a glitch with the uh, foliage on this tree here. Which is a bit strange. Now, over here we see some guards as well. These are more gentlemen from the old camp. And they're just guarding this little bridge here. What are you doing here? What's it look like? We're guarding the bridge, of course. We make sure that no beasts cross the bridge. That seems kind of pointless. Uh, first of all, there's Make already sure a... you get to the old camp. They're holding a pickaxe for you. <laughs> oh, you're a scumbag. Now, there's already a lot of landmass behind the bridge, on the other side of the bridge, for monsters to come from. So, I don't think really preventing these beasts from crossing the bridge is, uh... You know, really that useful of a task. Have you got any advice for me? Yeah, don't go in the forest on your own. Unless you're strong enough to fight off all the beasts. Now that was actually useful information. What do you have to tell me? Hi, I'm new here. How nice for you. Indeed. 
Is that the old camp over there? No, that's the new camp. The old camp is underneath the bridge. Oh, so you are an asshole. Of course, there's nothing underneath the bridge, so he's clearly lying. Now, this is one of the uh, many kind of like hidden areas that the game has. If you swim through here, there's a bit of a cave. Unfortunately, in this game, there's not really anything in here. So it's just kind of po uh, kind of pointless, a wasted opportunity to give you some kind of reward for exploring, but when you come back through this area in Gothic 2, there will be stuff here, so definitely any place you can think of between the two games is worth exploring a second time. Now, one of the things I had a problem with was the water flickering, as you saw earlier. It's definitely not as bad now. It still happens, but it was a huge problem uh, when I was trying to record this game the first time. I, I couldn't really explain why it was happening. I just I had to repeatedly reinstall the game in the mod just to make sure it worked. Uh, right in there, we got some mole rats, and there is some uh, loot in there, but we're not going to worry about it right now. Uh, we do have to get a superior weapon and hopefully some uh, protective clothes as well. We've got a couple guards here guarding the gate. Where do you think you're going? To the camp. You ain't come to make trouble, have you? Of course I have. Sure. I plan to take on the whole camp. Hey, this guy's funny. I don't like funny guys. Uh oh. Retreat! Actually, no, I'll just demonstrate. Try that again, and you'll regret it. Now, unfortunately, he's taking my money. Shit, he hasn't even got any ore on him. I don't? I thought I had some. So, you can see that we're still breathing. We're not quite dead, although our health has reached one. <laughs> so, the uh, one of the unique things about this game that most other games don't do is that being knocked down by a melee attack does not outright kill you. So, uh, if you want to kill someone who gets knocked down, you have to attack them while they're down and it will... Uh, perform a killing blow on them. So, this means you can get in a lot of fights in this game and not have to worry about dying. The problem is, as you saw, he was trying to take my gold, my ore. He didn't take any because I don't really have enough. Uh, essentially, I think how the mechanic works is they will take half the ore you have on your in your inventory. And since I only had three, I, just, I guess the script didn't uh, really care. So, as you can see, it's easy to get into trouble in this game. But, uh, that's just kind of like your first warning, essentially. If you continue to behave like that, you can and will get yourself killed. So you do have to be very delicate about how you uh, interact with people from now on. 